Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeffrey Rochko from Carleton University, and in this video, we're going to talk about how to calculate resistance for members that have both axial load and bending at the same time. So up to now, we've covered how do we design columns, uh, which are members with just compression load. How do we uh, design tension size? You know, members with just tension. We've talked all about how to design beams, which take bending and shear. But what happens if we have a member that does both at the same time? And I'm going to show some examples of why we might want to look at that. What kind of members we'll run into. I'm going to show the code equations uh, from the standard. And then I'm going to elaborate a bit on what those equations mean and why they are the way that they are. So first, what are the situations where we might run into this situation? Well, the, might, the most obvious is a situation where I actually have directly an axial load and a bending load um, simultaneously. So one situation is I have a column, for example, and that column has a axial load, which is caused by gravity. And then it also has potentially some kind of lateral load along its length, which would could be caused, for example, by a direct wind load being applied to a column. So maybe I have windows attached to that column. And so the wind load directly bends the column. So now here I have both bending um, and axial load. Here is another example. Say for example that I have a roof frame. Um, that roof frame has some uh, loads that are direct from the roofing. So this is a roof truss, but the truss has direct uh, bending loads. Um, and also those uh, loads on the truss um, cause tension and compression in the truss members. So these top two members in this example will be in compression and the bottom member would be in tension. So for these ones on top, roof beams, for example, I have moment plus compression Okay, and then let's say that this is a floor, maybe this is an attic space. And I have some kind of loads on it. Maybe in some part of it, then for that one, I have a moment plus a tension load simultaneously. And using the equations in the standard, I can calculate the strength of both of these cases. Okay, so that's the most obvious one, but there is another one that is very common, which you might not think about on first blush. And that is what happens if we have an eccentric load on the top of a column, for example. Okay, so let's say that we have a column here and now I'm looking at the top of the column. And let's say that instead of the load being applied right at the center of that member, let's say that it's applied instead at some other location. Could be due to um, just construction tolerances, could be due to however the way that the um, load is being applied. Maybe I have two loads, maybe I have one on either side and they're not exactly the same. So then I have basically a offset between the location of my load and the location of the center of the column. And that distance in that horizontal direction like this is my, what I call E, my eccentricity. Okay, so why does that cause a moment? Well, you can see that if I'm looking now, uh, I'm looking at the side of this, so I'm looking this way. Um, and I have my load P here. Okay, this is P, which is now applied at a certain eccentricity, um, E. Now, if we were thinking about that load on a section, it's like if we were doing a concrete beam design or something like that, and we had a load caused by rebar and it was offset, we know that that load causes a moment. So this is going to be equivalent to a situation that looks like this, where I have my P at the center, 
but I combine that with a moment, and that moment equals p times e. So the, uh, the distance between the neutral axis and the load, uh, the eccentricity is what is causing basically a, um, an effective moment PE, because now we need to um, basically resist that with a couple. Okay, just a note here to uh, elaborate on what I said before. Okay, so this uh, E, the eccentricity is uh, often uh, included for members, uh, even those uh, where we're considering that they're axially loaded, because um, if I have a, fa a fabrication imperfection, so whatever my connection plate is not fabricated perfectly or it's not installed correctly, um, so I have some construction tolerance on where the location of that load is actually going to exist, then I can assume some nominal eccentricity E to account for those effects and to make sure that, um, um, you know, if I accidentally get a little bit of eccentricity because of construction, that I'm not going to fail my member. Okay, so that is the effect of eccentric axial load. So now let's look at how we take this um, combined axial load and moment effect into account in our uh, equations in the standard. Okay, so the approach that we take for axial load and moment is pretty much exactly the same between lumber and glue lamb uh, for both the 14, 2014 standard and the 2019 standard. Um, and it's split into uh, what happens if I have tension and bending uh, versus what happens if I have compression and bending. This is something that you probably um, have seen before in other materials. Um, like concrete has a different uh, effect when I have compression plus bending. Um, okay, so if I have tension plus bending, I basically have to check. So it's not that I come up with a straight up strength. What I have to do is I have to check um, an interaction equation. And that interaction equation is an inequality uh, that looks like this. I basically have my applied tension force my factor at applied tension divided by my tension resistance that I calculate using the regular tension resistance equation. And I have an applied moment, which is a factored moment on the section divided by my moment resistance. And so I have like a percentage, I'm taking up a percentage of my tension force, uh, tension resistance and a percentage of my moment resistance. And those two percentages have to be less than or equal to 100% or one. And this is what we call a, um, this is like the simplest kind of interaction equation that you can have. And it's a conservative interaction equation. Um, and it's appropriate for this um, case for sure, which uh, we're gonna look at the details of that in a minute after we lay out all of these equations. So that's tension plus bending. Then what about if we have compression and bending? So we have something similar here for compression plus bending. You can see we have a percentage of our compression parallel strength, PF over PR, and we have here a percentage of our moment strength, MF divided by MR. But then we have these additional things that are different, these effects, they have a squared here, and we have this big term which modifies the percentage of uh, moment relative to our moment resistance. And we are gonna look in detail as to um, why those two effects exist here. But again, it's similar. I'm checking some, um, some kind of way of calculating a percentage that I'm using up of my axial compression and some percentage modified of uh, how much of my moment resistance I'm using up and um, combining those together and making sure that I'm using up less than the combined 100% uh, resistance. So we have one more kind of resistance percentage in this equation, PE, which is on the right side over here. And that is um, basically how close our section is to our Euler buckling load. Um, and the Euler buckling load is calculated like this. 
where we're basically using our E05. That's our Young's modulus, but the fifth percentile Young's modulus. We're using that because this is a strength equation. Again, modified by KSEKT. I have my, um, my I, my moment of inertia, and I have my effective length LE squared. So I'm just going to lay out all the different parts of these equations for the note. So PF over PR is basically my percentage of the resistance um, for axial compressive load that I am uh, using up. So PF is my factored axial compression in the parallel to green direction, and PR is my factored um, axial compressive load resistance. Um, one uh, little wrinkle, so that's just calculated the normal way for a lumber. For glue lamb, there's a minor wrinkle here, which is that the PR needs to be calculated using a potentially slightly different strength. So instead of using FC that we would get from our tables, uh, you know, 7.3, um, instead we use FCB, which in principle could be different. And I get those from the same table. Um, in practice, that FCB is typically equal to FC. So it doesn't really make a difference, but technically um, those values could be different. That's a compression. It's basically a compression strength um, for use in combined compression and, and uh, bending situations um, instead of using the regular just uh, compression alone strength. But as I said, it's basically, um, I think it's always or almost always the same as FC. Um, so that's the compression. Now I have a moment. And also for uh, tension. So we have our factored axial tension load and the related resistance. So PR, MR, TR, we calculate all of these things using the same equations that we usually use to calculate PR, MR, and TR. Then for the Euler buckling equation, we have LE, which is an effective length And that effective length is in the plane of the applied moment. So um, it depends on which way I'm loading this. So if I'm um, if I have a moment that in my beam column is bending my beam like this, then I need to look at the effective length for buckling basically in that direction. Okay, so then here my effective length will be top to bottom. If I had a restraint in the middle, then my effective length would be just a half of that height if it was right in the middle. Um, it would not be then the effective length for the other direction. Okay, so it's the effective length in the same direction as I'm applying a moment for my moment, combined moment, and um, axial um, compression resistance. And LE is an effective length, and KE is our effective length factor, which we have seen before. For pin pin, uh, KE equals 1. We have the same issue for I, where I is the moment of inertia. Which moment of inertia? The moment of inertia associated with bending in the plane of the applied moment. Okay, what happens if you have moment in two directions? Um, the standard in the um, commentary does provide um, a, um, suggested, a suggested method for um, calculating the interaction of axial and moment in both directions. And I will um, talk about that towards the end of this um, topic. Okay, so that is my uh, two equations. So now that I have this, this is basically all I need in order to calculate um, the interaction between bending and axial load. So basically as long as my TF, TR, MF, MR, when I sub them in, satisfy this inequality, as long as TF over TR and MF over MR added together is less than one, then that means that my design is okay. Same for compression and bending, as long as that term on the left, when I sub in all of those, um, is less than one, then um, that means that my design is okay. So, um, you know, you could see that uh, it might take a little bit of trial and error um, to figure out a situation where um, all of these things are going to be uh, true simultaneously. Okay, so now let's take these equations 
and look at them in a bit more detail and determine why they exist in the way that they exist. And we'll start with the um, tension and um, bending uh, interaction. Okay, so the tension one is very simple. Basically, I have one term, as I mentioned, that is basically re represents the percentage of the tension capacity that I've used up with the tension load that I've applied, and MF over MR is the percentage of the moment capacity that I've used up um, with my applied MF. And as long as those two percentages, when added together, are less than 100, then everything is fine. And this is a simple interaction. So for example, if I'm using up 40% of the tension capacity and I want to know how much moment I can apply on top of that, um, I'll know that I have 100%, I've already used 40%, so therefore um, I can use 60% of my moment capacity. So 40% of my tension capacity, 60% of my moment capacity, those two together um, equal 100%, and that's my limit. Okay, and we'll, and we'll see why that works. It's because axial load and tension are basically directly additive in terms of stress. Um, what does this interaction look like if I were to plot it? So let's say I have my TF over TR here on one axis. So my, my total percentage of tension taken up and MF over MR on the other axis. And so if I had, if I'm not using any of my moment capacity, then obviously I can use 100% of my tension capacity. And if I use, um, if I'm not using any of my tension capacity, so TF over TR is zero, then obviously I should be able to use 100% of my moment capacity. Those are just basically the tension only case and the moment only case, which are cases that we've already looked at. So that makes sense. MF over MR has to be less than one for those cases. That's our requirement that MR is greater than uh, MF. In between, this equation basically looks like this, a straight line, okay? And you know, this is the equation um, TF over TR equals one minus MF over MR. This is just, I've just rearranged this so that it's in like a Y uh, equals MX plus B kind of form. So the vertical intercept is one and the slope is negative one basically. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense, I think. So for example, if I used 40%, of my tension capacity, then what would I have remaining? I would have 60% of my moment capacity remaining. And that's the way the equation works. We'll basically never draw this, um, but that's that's uh, basically what's happening. So all of the um, all of the area under here are valid design um, valid design states. Like I don't have to use up a total of 100%. I could have a situation in here. This is fine, right? You know, if I'm using up 50% of my tension strength and only 20 or 30% of my moment strength, that's no problem, right? I am less than, um, I am less than um, my um, total interaction. Okay, so this this area under here is basically TF over TR. You can't read that in green. Is basically. Uh, TF over TR plus MF over MR is less than or equal to one. So the line is where it equals one and the area underneath is when it's less than one. So that's my, my total design space basically. Okay, so why does this work? Okay, if I'm talking about um, tension and bending. Okay, so the reason is because um, bending stresses are axial stresses, right? Bending, um, a bending moment in a section causes tension on one side of the section and compression on the other side of the section. So if I split these up, I can look at what is the tension effect. Okay, here a tension load is going to create a uniform tension stress along the height of the section. Let's call that sigma t1, that's my tension effect. For a moment, okay, we are familiar with what is the stress in a beam 
along the cross section when I have a moment, right? As long as my beam is linear, then I have a compression stress on the top in this case and a tension stress on the bottom. We'll call that sigma C for compression and sigma T2 for tension. This is my M effect. Okay, we know that um, sigma C equals sigma T2 for uh, rectangles, which almost all wood beams are rectangular cross sections. Okay, so now if I add these up and I find the total effect, what I do is just add the stresses at every level, like basically at every fiber. And what I'm gonna get is my compression is gonna be reduced by adding the tension and my tension side is going to increase. The slope of this is going to be the same because the slope is my curvature. And so this is going to be T1 plus T2. And over here, I'm going to have basically C plus sigma T1. Okay, and this is a linear distribution in case you can't tell that it's linear. Okay, so I basically add up all the stresses. In, in this case, you know, I'm considering that sigma C is negative value. So I add sigma C and T1 and uh, my negative value reduces. Or, you know, could be that, um, you know, could also look like this, depending on what is the val the relative value of these two things, right? Could be could be anything like that. I could put the whole, the whole thing into tension. But the important thing to realize is that um, my stresses, the stress caused by axial force and the stress caused by moment are basically additive. So each one uses up some portion of whatever is my total um, strength, right? So this might be my strength here. That would be for wood, we call that typically FT is our strength. And so once I exceed that strength, which I can get stresses from either tension or bending that will increase my total maximum tension stress. Once my total maximum tension stress reaches FT, then that's when I'm going to get failure. So since these two are additive, it makes sense that I have an interaction that looks like this, where I have basically um, some percentage of stress caused by tension, some percentage of the total maximum stress caused by moment. And if I add those two together, I better stay under 100% because each of these basically has the same effect in terms of increasing tension stress. Okay, so now let's uh, move on and talk about what's happening in the compression and bending interaction, because obviously there must be something different going on um, than uh, the simple interaction that's happening here. And it turns out that there are actually two major effects. So just to remind you, here is what that equation was. Okay, so I have my PF over PR, PR over, sorry, PF over PR, squared plus MF over MR times this term that um, basically amplifies the effect of moment depending on how close I am to my Euler buckling load. Um, so there's two things that are different here compared to tension. There is this squared term. So the first term is squared, which it wasn't before. And there's also the second term here, which uh, as I just mentioned, modifies my MF over MR. And so it's not a simple interaction anymore. And there are two different effects, and we're going to talk about each of them in turn. So this term, uh, this squared term, basically accounts for the difference between tension strength and compression strength. So if we're talking about tension, we know we could add our stresses until we get to FT. And then once we get to FT, um, we get our failure. But um, FT and FC are not equal. And it turns out that usually FC is greater than FT. So FT is kind of the limiting stress. So in tension, you know, we don't have to consider at all what happens um, with FC. But in compression, we actually do because we actually have an increased compression strength. Just like in concrete, you know, concrete has obviously a higher strength in compression uh, than it does in tension. And that's why we get those kind of um, bubbly uh, interactions that we see in concrete. And we get a similar thing in 
wood. So if you want to see what I'm talking about, if I come back to one of our strength tables, you see that we have FC and FT and FC is always um, quite a bit larger than FT. Why is that? I mean, tension strength in timber is very high, right? And we know that, uh, you know, the tension strength of the fibers is very high, but the problem is that for um, a full member, instead, like if we're talking about an actual piece of wood, instead of just wood fibers, when we have tension, obviously any kind of imperfections and knots and everything like that within the wood decreases that tension strength. And it, and it affects tension strength much more than compression strength, because for compression strength, um, if I have a knot, that doesn't really necessarily reduce my compression strength because I'm just kind of pushing on the knot. Whereas a knot will really decrease my tension strength because where that knot is basically it means I have a reduction in effective area. That's one effect, for example. And the same is uh, true for um, glue lamb. So if I go to the glue lamb table, uh, you'll see that my FC is very high, but my FT um, tends to be significantly lower. Okay, so how, how does this actually make a difference? Because, you know, that's one thing to say that that makes a difference, but wouldn't, wouldn't tension still govern because tension is lower? Um, well, no, not necessarily. And let's look at an example of why that is the case. Okay, so let's say that we have a uh, beam beam column uh, with just pure bending. We're going to start just with bending for now. And uh, we have a tension strength FT of 10 and a compression strength FC of 20. Now, remember in practice, we usually look at, um, you know, a bending strength instead of a compression strength and a tension strength. But since right now we're looking at basically what's happening in the fibers, let's just consider for now that these two things are, are separate. This is not usually how we calculate the bending strength, but just for sake of argument. Um, stick with me for now. So here's my section. Okay, I'm applying a pure moment here. No axial load. So this is what my stress is going to look like. And let's say that I have a stress, a bending stress, or I've ha I have a bending moment that is such that my bending stress has reached my tension strength. Okay, so here um, let's say this is my tension strength line here, and that is FT, and that was 10 MPa. And let's say that my, I have actually reached, so my sigma here is actually 10 MPa. Okay, so this is um, at failure of the beam. Okay, so I have expected that if I add any more moment, um, I uh, will basically break the beam. So I'm right at the tension strength. Okay, what's happening at this point on the compression side? On the compression side, we have kind of, we're saying we have double the strength. So this might be where my FC is, 20 MPa. You know, this is 20 MPa. You know, this is negative, we could say that's a negative stress because it's on the compression side. Okay, so, um, our actual stress is 10 MPa, um, but we still have this gap here on the compression side. So we haven't reached the compression strength um, yet at this point. We have quite a large gap. Okay, but the beam's still gonna fail because once it reaches the tension strength, tension fibers are gonna break, the whole beam fails, and it's game over, man. So let's uh, now consider that I'm taking the same beam that we're starting at this point where we're basically just underneath the tension strength or just at the tension strength, but not yet failed. And now let's add a compression stress, uh, a uniform compression stress. So I'm adding a compression load to the beam. Okay, this green line is my neutral axis, obviously, by the way. Okay, so I still have the moment. This is the same moment that I had before. Now I'm adding a compression load P what is going to happen to the state of stress in this beam? Wow, that is a real crooked line here. Let's straighten it out a little bit first. Not great, but good enough. Okay, so now I'm going to start with my cross-section again. So what happens when I add a compressive stress, a uniform compressive stress? Basically, all the stress values are going to shift by 5 MPa, right? So now I'm going to end up at 5 MPa. 
on my tension side and 50 in MPA on my compression side, right? So I started basically here. Let's do it again. And I ended up basically on the purple line. Okay, so same slope. And now where am I relative to my strengths? Okay, so my strength over here is still 20. And my strength over here, this should line up with this orange line here, is still 10. So whereas before, my tension, uh, my tension side was right at the tension uh, strength, my tension side has now moved over by 5 MPA. And so now there is a space here, right? So this has shifted. So this is shift 5 MPA, right? And now we basically have a gap on both sides. So now neither the tension or the compression sides are at the limit. I have gaps in both sides. Okay, so now what can I do? So now I started with a moment. I added my compression. So I've shifted my stress profile by 5 MPA in this example. And um, now I am not at the limit on either the tension side or the compression side. Both sides I have space. So that means that I could add more moment. Okay, so I have my P and I have my original moment M plus now I'm adding an extra moment M extra. So now what does my profile look like? Okay, so I started basically at five and 15 and when I increase, let's say I increase it so that I get five extra on either side Now my profile looks like this. Okay, so I went from 15 and five, and now I've added some moment. So I've increased equally on my tension and compression sides by five. I'm at 20 here and 10 here. And lo and behold, now I have reached again my limits. This is my FT equals 10 and my FC equals 20. So when I didn't have any compression load, I had a certain moment capacity M. Now that I've added compression, my moment capacity is M plus M extra. So I have managed to basically um, increase the amount of moment that I can apply to this beam by increasing at the same time the amount of compression. So I've added more load and increased the strength. Right, this is also something that we see in concrete. So this is probably not a completely new um, concept to you if you've taken concrete before. But the good news is that this results in a more efficient use of the section strength. And this all comes about because of the fact that the compression strength and the tension strength are not the same. So how does this manifest? Again, going back, we have our PF over PR. We're squaring that. So what happens when we square a number that's less than one? Basically, we reduce it, right? It's like if we had 20%, we do 0.2 times 0.2, and um, we get like point, uh, point 0.04, right? So PF over PR is always going to be less. PF over PR squared is always going to be less than PF over PR if PF over PR that we start with is less than one, uh, which it always is. Because if our PF over PR was greater than one, then that would mean that we have a failure um, by definition. Okay, so that PF squared is a way to take this effect into account. And that comes from um, testing data. Okay, I'm gonna put a cut in here um, before we go back and look at what the effect of the second term is and how we get it. Um, and then after that, I'm going to also look at um, the interaction diagram for axial and compression, and also looking at some other approaches that you can use and what to do if you have biaxial bending and compression. So, uh, so far we've just looked at tension, combined tension and bending, 
and uh, the effect of the first term of compression and bending, and um, we're going to continue on in the next video.